Hey everybody, David Shapiro here with a video. Um, I, I know that I did say that I'm taking a break um, from research, but apparently I'm getting back into the groove of making YouTube videos. So there was a discussion on um, the OpenAI forum. Um, this guy, he saw my video about reducing confabulation and he had some questions. Um, and uh, so first I just wanted to say that like, uh, if I have not been as helpful of, as an educator as some of you would have liked, that's my fault because I was primarily using YouTube as a mode of dissemination. Um, but, uh, and it, this probably seems obvious to other people, um, basically what I'm doing is I'm trying to teach people what I have learned and what I have discovered. But to me, it was like I didn't connect the dots, right? And I don't even know why, because I, uh, I do uh, training and teaching and mentoring and professionally in my day job. So anyways, uh, I just wanted to say that like, I am learning to put on my professor hat. You can see like, I'm dressing the part better and um, I've moved into my own office um, in my house. I'm getting it all decked out. So uh, yeah, so practicing putting on my professor hat. Um, I don't do teaching full time, uh, so I'm getting used to it anyways. So he asked this question, very salient question, can GPT generate its own fine tuning training data? A lot of my videos, I do what's called synthetic data. Uh, and so basically what, what synthetic data is, and I've got a few articles up here, I'll put them all in the comments. Um, just can GPT-3 create uh, synthetic training data for machine learning models? The short answer is yes. Um, many of my videos, I demonstrate how to do this. Um, and then here's a uh, Forbes article talking about synthetic data is about to revolutionize artificial intelligence. Here's an NVIDIA article talking about the same thing that um, synthetic data with transformers is gonna, you know, is good for enterprise. Um, and this was May 9th, so this was uh, a month and a half ago. And then finally, um, uh, towards data science article, um, just over a year, uh, almost a year and a half old about synthetic data. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say that uh, if, you, if you have seen all the videos that I have shown where I used GPT-3 to generate its own training data for fine tuning models, um, that is a legitimate practice. It does have its own pitfalls and, uh, and strengths though. Um, and so going through this, um, there was, there, the, so the, the first thing is like, okay, why? What's the benefit? If you're just using one model to generate output and then fine tune the model, what are you actually getting out of that? Um, and so I wanted to um, kind of go over kind of the, 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 the top level reasons. Even if you don't use much different data, um, there's, a few, there's a few benefits. So first of all, when you generate fine tuned um, or fine tuning data or synthetic data with something like GPT-3, you can filter out the ones that you don't like, the samples that you don't like, so that you can get a more consistent model. And we'll get to that in a, in a minute. Like, what do I mean by consistency? Um, that's the question of precision versus accuracy. But then there's also the problem of confabulation or hallucination in these models, and we'll get to that as well. Um, so then another advantage is that you can incorporate multiple prompts. Um, so for instance, rather than just have one prompt, you can have data that is several different prompts, um, either stacked, right, where you have meta prompts or prompt chaining to generate the output, um, or you can have, you can go more, more lateral scaling, which by that I mean you can have multiple different types of problems um, in your fine tuning data. I've, I've demonstrated that in my core objective functions, um, fine tuning uh, 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 videos where I actually train one model to do three different tasks. So you can either do different tasks, like go sideways where it's like task one, task two, task three, and you have one model that can do all of them. And also this chair is squeaking. Let me, let me swap, swap chairs real quick, sorry. Okay, sorry about that. I got a $10 chair, used chair, just to see like, okay, if it works, it'll be good, but it was squeaking, so it's no good. Um, $10 wasted, not a big deal. Okay, sorry. So, um, so yeah, when you, when you do synthetic data with GPT-3, you can incorporate multiple prompts. And, and that means that you can either do prompt stacking, where you generate data that requires multiple prompts to generate the, the input and output, or you can do multiple tasks or both. Um, in my uh, core objective functions, let me actually show you core objective functions in experiment four, I actually had to use, um, 
maybe it wasn't this one. Oh yeah. So in this one, I actually had to use, uh, I, I did both. So this one is trained to do three different functions, um, three different tasks, which is reduce suffering, increase prosperity and increase understanding. But to increase understanding, to get that synthetic data, it actually took three prompts. Um, and most of it was just the first two prompts. But the point is, is that I, I basically um, trained one model to do five different tasks all, all in one. So that's another advantage of doing, um, of using uh, fine tuning uh, GPT-3 with its own synthetic data is you can kind of compress different problems into one model. Um, and in their documentation, um, OpenAI said that, uh, that doing this actually tends to increase the performance of all. So you get, you get some transference effect where um, the, the bigger your fine tuning data set is, the better performance that you get overall. Um, let's see. And then finally, you can incorporate um, lots of different data. So if you don't, if you do 100% synth synthetic data, um, which this is not. So in this one, I had, um, I had some real world data from like Reddit, um, which is, so that's not synthetic at all. But in my chat bots um, that I did, those are, um, those, some of those are 100% synthetic. Um, let's see, do, 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 do. let me, where did they get one? Um, actually the movie script generator, because in this one, the premises were all generated by GPT-3 as well, right? So this is 100% syn synthetic data where the input that I generated was synthetic and then the output was also synthetic. Um, so the chatbots that I've done, the movie script generator, those are 100% syn synthetic. But other ones, if you take real world data to generate or for the input, and then only the output is synthetic, then it's only 50% synthetic. Um, so I just wanted to, to clarify on that point as well. So going back to here, um, yeah, so you can, you can have different data sources as well. And one thing that I found, so um, I realized that I, I don't think I've ever actually said this, so here's me putting on my professor hat. This is why. Um, this is why I like having different data sources is because um, and I actually discovered this with the um, core objective function experiment, where if you go to, where was it? Here we go. Um, so the original one, uh, oops, that's not what I meant to click on. Core objective functions, experiment one, there we go. Um, so what I did here was I had 50,000 different contexts that I could pull from. Some of them were dialogue, some of them were Reddit discussions, some of them were uh, Stack Exchange questions, some of them were news articles, right? And so it's not just having one type of input data, I actually have different types of unstructured data going in. And so when you fine tune or when you generate synthetic data to fine tune with entirely different structures of data, because like a dial, you know, a dialogue is one format of data, a news article is another format, a Reddit post is an entirely different format. So by showing, by, by fine tuning with different kinds of input formats, you get the model more robust so it can generalize and say, okay, whatever, whatever my input format is, I'm still gonna do this one task. Because if you get to where you're trying, um, and this one, if you go to my, it's actually one of my most popular videos, um, it, 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 I, I had already figured this out. So let me show you, um, let's see, view count, this one. So fine tuning to generate questions about anything. Um, I actually, this is where I had figured that out is because uh, I found that if, um, when I was doing, when I was originally doing this experiment, if I wanted it to ask questions about dialogue, like it would say like, ask as a third party observer to ask about what's going on here, it would actually try and participate in the dialogue. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not asking you to jump in and be a participant in the dialogue. I'm saying ask questions about what's going on here. And then I would switch and say, like ask questions about this news article, right? And so by having disparate formats of data, different kinds of input data, with your, with your, when you're generating synthetic data, you can get better performance because it will say, oh, you want me to generate questions of this particular format every time irrespective, ir not irregardless, that's not a real word, irrespective or regardless of um, how, the, how the input is formatted. Um, so that's a really critical thing and I realize that I haven't ever really fully explained that. Um, and so, you know, professor hat. Um, okay, so that was the first thing and, um, and this guy, and I, I do have to apologize because like, 
I was, I'm not in that mindset of like, oh, I'm, I'm here as an educator. So this is me practicing being an educator. Um, and so then he said like, oh, well, when you say confabulating and hallucinating, that sounds like it's too far from the truth, which is technically yes, but hallucination and confabulation in transformers or large language models is different. So this is one of my favorite diagrams of all time. Um, it's, a, it's the difference between accuracy and precision, right? So if you're precise, you have a very tight cluster, a very tight group. Um, and so you see on the right side where you have high precision, um, it's like very precise. So you, you say, like, this is the answer, but in this case, it's far from the truth. Uh, and then if you have something that is both accurate and precise, it is consistent and close to the bullseye. And on the other hand, if you have something that is neither accurate nor precise, it's completely random, right? The output is completely random. However, with the, so this applies to normal machine learning models like um, support vector machines, k nearest neighbor, um, those sorts of things. Any kind of regression, this applies. With large language models, this this does still apply somewhat, but confabulation is an entirely new phenomenon. And so the um, the the I found an article that talks about like what confabulation is. Um, and so confabulation is something that happens in people where you just make stuff up. It's completely fabricated. You're filling in blanks. Um, and the key word there is that it's fabricated. Um, it has nothing to do with the act, what, what, what the actual input was. And so what can happen with GPT-3, um, especially the older models, like the original Da Vinci and Curie, is it goes off the rails. This, that's just the turn of phrase that a lot of people end up using, um, is that it's completely making up its own narrative. It's not attached to what you, what it, the input was at all. The more recent Instruct series, the text Da Vinci 2 ones, those have had that, a lot of that fine-tuned out of it, um, but it will still do that. It'll still just completely start making up its own thing. Um, and so what I did was I created a graphic to help explain that. And so I said, like, imagine this field is a little bit bigger, right? And then you actually have this thing where you have, like, negative precision or negative accuracy. It's not even zero precision or zero accuracy. You actually end up with negative values when you have hallucination and confabulation because it's giving you stuff that it shouldn't even have access to. It, it's giving you information that was in no way remotely contained in the original input. So confabulation and hallucination are entirely new machine learning concepts. Um, and this, I realize, is also not intuitive, especially if someone is coming from a, ma a purely math background. Um, so, you know, the, this, this is a really important thing to talk about, which is a, one of the reasons I was inspired to make this video. Um, and then there was something else I don't remember. I think that was about it. Um, yeah, so, you know, accuracy, precision, but then confabulation, whole new, whole new animal. Um, I think that's about it. Yeah, so... Uh, gr good questions. And again, I just want to reiterate, like, I'm stepping into a new role as an educator. I'm not just sharing, you know, because most of what I've done up to this point is being like working entirely on my own, um, just kind of like off, you know, writing books, doing research, which that's one thing, right, as an individual contributor. But as someone that like now people like a lot of you are asking questions. And sometimes like, we're on different wavelengths, right? Like, I have been keeping up with synthetic data, right? The idea that you can use transformers to do synthetic data, but not everyone is up to the same speed, right? And that is me learning about my role, my new role as not just someone who's doing research and sharing ideas, but also as an educator. So if I have, again, I'll just reiterate, if I have not been as helpful as you would like, I'm learning, right? I'm, I'm learning to teach and I'm learning to do this better. All right, I'm repeating myself now, so I'll go ahead and cut it off. But there you have it. Um, the short answer, yes, synthetic data is perfectly legit. Um, there are certain strengths and weaknesses, as with all methodologies in science. So thanks for watching, and uh, check, in, check in again later.